Well, here we go. This is our third and final day. Uh, this is the group that will actually be getting the merit badges. Um, and it's my distinct pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce our third speaker. Um, and I just want to, I know we're going to ha have a little closing here later today, uh, but uh, I've felt really good about the sort of intersection between what I hope uh, these past three days has been in terms of uh, some significant opportunity for learning, for the opportunity to share collaboratively uh, in that learning, uh, and to have fun. So as I noted, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Stephen L. Chu. Uh, Dr. Chu has been a professor and chair of psychology at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama since 1993. He's trained as a cognitive psychologist, and one of his primary research areas is the cognitive basis of effective teaching. He's a recognized authority on teaching, research, theory and practice. I thought it was interesting. I, I went and I looked at uh, uh, Dr. Chu's passion for teaching statement, uh, which uh, was a statement uh, that he obviously prepared uh, as part of the recognition in terms of one of the very prestigious awards that he has received. And quote from uh, Dr. Chu, he says, I feel a strong obligation to share what I know about teaching with both teachers and students to improve student learning. My approach is different from popular, popular collections of tips, gimmicks, and teaching fads. I try to deepen their understanding of how people learn and, con and c correct counterproductive misconceptions so that teachers can improve their pedagogy regardless of the methods they use and students can improve their learning by devising their own effective study strategies. In addition to uh, you know, being a recognized authority in terms of the uh, teaching and learning environment, uh, his research interests, uh, which have tacked many of these kind of tenacious misconceptions about learning, uh, uh, and uh, one of the other things I think that uh, Dr. Chu has done is that he clearly w w do what, what we might describe as walking the talk. You know, there are a number of us sometimes that are excellent scholars in terms of s some of the research that we produce. Um, but here's a, here's a man who not only has contributed significantly to understanding of the scholarship of teaching and learning, but he himself has been very highly recognized for many of his own best practices uh, that he uh, integrates into his learning environment. He has won a number of local and national awards for the quality of his own teaching. Um, he's been a Carnegie Scholar, Carnegie Academy of Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, won the John H. Buchanan Award for Excellence in Classroom Teaching from Samford University. He's been the Alabama Professor of the Year, uh, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching uh, Award, and uh, the Robert S. Daniel Excellence in Teaching Award from the Society uh, for Teaching from the, Psycho from the American Psychological Association. But most recently, and something that we should all be very, very proud of in terms of our association uh, with uh, Dr. Chu and with Samford University as a member of our consortium. He was most recently awarded uh, the 2011 U.S. Professor of the Year for Masters, Universities, and Colleges by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. So that's a, that's a very prestigious distinction. So with no further ado, uh, I know Dr. Chu has some very interesting, exciting things to share with us this morning. Uh, it'll, we'll look forward to, after his presentation, again, to breaking into groups. Um,
perhaps even having an opportunity again to talk a little bit about the context of of not only his presentation, but its juxtapositioning with some of the other things that we've learned at the Institute. And with that, I give you Dr. Stephen Shu. Thank you, Sid. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I have to thank Sid and Nancy for inviting me to uh, speak here. I'm sorry I was not able to uh, be here for the uh, first couple of days of the session. I understand I have to follow not only two outstanding talks, but also the U.S. national ski jumping team. <laughs> so uh, the pressure is definitely, uh, is definitely on. Uh, you should all have a handout. Hopefully you have the handout that was in your seat uh, when you came in. There's going to be a little demonstration later. You're going to need a pen or a pencil for that. Uh, so you might want to uh, get that ready. I'll, I'll tell you when we get to that point. Um, let's see. Today, uh, for the presentation, I've set the following goals. This is a pretty a ambitious set of goals, but I think it kind of tells a complete story. Uh, we'll see how we do. I want to first discuss the level of college readiness of, of the typical college uh, freshman, the attitude and the beliefs they come in with. Then I want to talk about what students need to know about how people learn in order to become more effective learners. Um, talking about the misconceptions they have and how to correct them, talk about how to provide a cognitive framework to make them more effective uh, learners in their freshman year, and they're going to talk about what faculty need to know, uh, because they play an important role also in terms of, of what students, uh, or how students learn. And then finally, I want to discuss the cognitive basis of effective uh, pedagogy. So uh, that's going to be a pretty ambitious, as I say, uh, uh, set of goals to try and accomplish. All the work that I've done, all the things that, that Sid talked about, are, is based on, on one basic premise. Uh, all my research is based on, on this premise, that teaching uh, requires a mental model of how people learn. Okay? Every teacher has a mental model of how they think students learn best. Okay? And it influences everything that they do. It determines which pedagogy they use. So if you believe that students believe uh, work best when collaboratively, then you uh, pick collaborative learning techniques like problem-based learning, discovery-based learning, inner teaching. Uh, if you believe that they learn best when they are, are uh, presented information in a highly organized way from an expert, then you're probably going to pick more of a traditional uh, lecture model. Okay, And it also uh, determines if uh, uh, how you adjust your teaching as you go along. If you have a problem in a class, you rely on your model of teaching to come up with a solution for that problem. Okay. Now the problem is that if the problem lies outside of your mental model of teaching, you have no way of knowing how to adjust to that. All right. So if you have a difficulty with rapport with the class, for example, and rapport is not part of your model of effective teaching, that is not something that you're going to consider you know, that needs adjusting. All right. So to the extent that your model is accurate and complete, you will be an effective teacher. To the extent that your model is simplistic or flawed, then you will be less effective. Now, students also have a mental model of how uh, they themselves learn best. Okay. Um, now, this determines their behaviors also. Do I need to go to class or not, or can I just get the notes from somebody else? You know, do I have to read the whole chapter or do I just read the summary? You know, can, if the professor provides PowerPoint slides, can I just get by with that? Okay. How, you know, how much do I have to study in order to master material? Students make that decision based on their understanding of how they learn best and they have mastered material. And once again, to the extent that their model is accurate, they will be effective students and learners. To the extent that their model is inaccurate, they will struggle. Okay? Now, let's talk about uh, the typical incoming college student. All right, typical student comes in, they've graduated from high school, they have an average GPA nationally of 3.0, probably higher since NAC and U colleges tend to be uh, selective. Uh, they've probably passed uh, an exit exam successfully. They've been tested a number of times, uh, you know, for achievement. They and they've been uh, progressed in, in grades, and they've probably taken an entrance exam uh, to get into college. And certainly for NAC and U colleges, that is the case. So they have actually had a lot of success experiences before they actually get to college. Now, here is uh, the data from uh, ACT in 2011 uh, uh, for college readiness. Okay, based on ACT scores, and do I have a laser pointer? Let's see. No, that was not it. Okay, all right, no, that's not it either. Oh, is that it? Yeah, that's it, okay. 
last button, of course, I picked. All right, here is the percentage of readiness in English, mathematics, here's reading, here's science, and here's all four areas. You have 25% of the entering freshman class who are prepared for college work in all four areas. Only a quarter of the students are. Okay, so what does that mean then for students coming in? Typical student is inadequately prepared. Most of them are inadequately prepared at least one or more areas of, of, uh, of scholarship. And they are completely unaware of that fact. Okay? <laughs> Alright. So, they are likely overconfident coming in because they've had all these success experiences coming in from, uh, from high school. Alright, now, as a consequence then, many students are going to flounder. They're going to struggle academically in their first year of college. Okay, they're moving from a culture of completion in high school where we're trying to get as many students out the door as possible to a culture of access where you pay and you get to go to class but we don't care so much if you pass or not. Okay? All right. So, uh, their overconfidence then is going to prevent them from first recognizing that they have a problem. And then secondly, trying to identify, you know, what, uh, the, what change they need to, to, to make. Okay? Even if they want to change, their mental model is probably not adequate for them to find the ways in which they need to improve. Okay, some percentage of these students are going to flounder and flunk out before they actually make the transition to uh, becoming successful college students. Uh, others, uh, many others are going to have a terrible freshman year, at least. Okay, so what can we do about it? Okay, first we have to ask ourselves, what's the primary goal of teaching? Okay, what is our, our role as teachers or, uh, and in the classroom? Okay, it's either to present information that students are solely responsible for. So I just put the information out there and whether they learn it, it's up to them. Okay? If that's the case, then student adjustment to college is not my problem. Okay, I just put the information out there. I try to be up to date, I try to be interesting, I try to be organized, but what they do with it is up to them. Okay? But if I believe that teaching, the primary goal of teaching is to develop an understanding on the part of my students that is flexible, that is applicable, that helps to, in solving problems, then how they approach teaching, how they approach their own learning is my problem. I share responsibility for student learning with my students. Okay, so that's the first thing that you have to decide. Okay, and a lot of faculty are, are on both sides of this issue. If you're, you know, at the first part, you're the ones who just piss piss about how poorly prepared the students are these days and, and how you know, we're dumbing down the curriculum. Okay, from the second part, it concerns you because students are underperforming. We need to find a way to improve, uh, to improve their performance. Okay, so how can we uh, sort of attack this problem of students being overconfident and unaware? Right, uh, there's remediation. So we can make them take remedial courses uh, to try and get them up to, up to par. It's time consuming, it's expensive, students don't like it, and the results are probably kind of mixed on how effective that is. Okay, we can teach them to adjust uh, through things like uh, uh, college transition courses. At, at Stanford, it's called Foundations, it used to be called Horizons. A lot of schools have these kinds of first year college experience courses. It, it involves time management, not killing your, you know, your roommate, and, uh, uh, you know, and plus there's usually some study tips. You know, go to class, take notes, uh, you know, read the material, things like along those lines. Okay, it's just part of that. Okay, I'm proposing a Another alternative, which is to teach students to be more effective learners. Okay, try and challenge the misconceptions they have about learning, and uh, help them to, to to you know arm them with more effective study strategies and help them to make that transition. It doesn't make it uh, you know any easier in the sense of you know it's still going to be a struggle, but it, it you know it's more efficient. You waste less time doing uh, uh, ineffective things or things that are even more counterproductive. Okay. Now, uh, this kind of came about, this idea, uh, based on a, a talk I give every year to the entire freshman class at Stanford. Uh, I've given uh, workshops to teachers for years talking about the cognitive base of effective learning, and, I, and I've always known that, that um, the same information would be useful to students, uh, you know, as to how we, how we learn best. Uh, but I, I never really knew how to put it into practice until 2006 when uh, Dana Basinger, who was the director of freshman life at at, at Sanford asked me to present, uh, make a presentation to the entire freshman class on how to study more effectively. Okay? So this really got me thinking about, you know, what do students need to know, okay, about how students, how, how they learn that will really be helpful to them. Alright. Now, it's not that simple, 
to, get, to develop a uh, presentation like this. Because students expect to be lectured to about how hard college is going to be. Right? Uh, so, you know, and then there's that overconfidence factor. They, you know, they're, they're just going to say, you know, don't talk to, you know, they're, they're at that age, in traditional age, uh, they're traditional students where they simply, they're, they're anxious, but they don't really want, think they can learn anything from someone older than them. Okay? All right. So, you know, if I go up and say, you know, I'm a college professor and you better study hard because this college is this tough, you know, college, you know, it's going to be the, the basic, you know, gentlemen, look to your left, look to your right, you know, at the end of this, uh, this year. You know, one out of three are not going to be here. And they're going to see it as, you know, I'm a scary old guy who's, you know, going to tell you, make you work hard for no apparent reason. Okay? And such a lecture would be useless. All right, so here are the challenges I faced when developing this lecture. Um, okay, first I had to overcome negative preconceptions that students had. I wanted to set a tone of, you know, I want you to succeed. Okay, and I have information that will uh, help you meet this academic challenge. Listening to me is worth your time. Okay? Um, I had to overcome uh, the student misconceptions about learning, such as magic bullets. You know, they think there's some, you know, uh, there should be an app for college you know, education. Uh, they can just buy it off iTunes and it'll get them through. Uh, then I wanted to present uh, cognitive principles and research that would help them become better learners. Um, I wanted to make the presentation engaging, accessible, and memorable, and I had to do it in 45 minutes. Okay, so that was kind of the the challenge. All right, so really what I was trying to do here is I wanted to give the students not a bunch of disconnected teaching tips. I wanted to give them a coherent research-based framework that they could use to start to develop their own teaching strategies because there's not a single way to study. I mean, you study one way for science, a different way for math, a different way for English literature. So what you needed is a framework that would allow you to identify what are good strategies, what are bad strategies, and how do I develop the strategies that work for me for this topic, for this teacher? Okay, that's what I was going for. I, I wanted to show them how to apply the framework to their study. I wanted to make it obvious that uh, this was this was useful, uh, useful to them. So here's kind of the basic outline of the uh, of the of the talk that I ended up uh, giving. Uh, I started out talking about uh, misconceptions, and I called it uh, beliefs about learning that make you stupid. Okay, I decided. Not to call it, you know, misconceptions that undermine your learning. It's a little dry. I, I wanted them to remember this, uh, that these were bad things, okay? I talked about metacognition, which is, I'll talk about more in a minute, um, which is your awareness of, of how much you really understand material. Uh, I gave them a quiz, which uh, we're actually going to do in a minute, about uh, how accurate they understand uh, how best people learn best. I gave them a demonstration of levels of crossing, which we're also going to do in a minute. Uh, and uh, then I told them how to use this, this cognitive framework called levels of processing to uh, improve their own to improve their own learning. Okay, so here I am uh, giving it uh, back in 2006. We gave it, uh, the timing is really critical. I give the talk uh, about five or six weeks into the semester. All right, so that way they've had the first round of midterms back and their little bubble is starting to burst, okay? So, uh, it's, and I think that's really, really uh, important because they're not going to listen to me, right? You know, no one, you know, goes to, uh, attends college and first day and says, I'm going to really struggle here. You know, oh, look, there's the reading and study skills lab. I'm going to spend a lot of time there. No, they don't do that, right? They're, because they're confident they're going to do well. <laughs> All right. So, um, what I'm going to do from this point on, in this part of the, of the uh, presentation is I'm going to talk to you as if you are freshman in, uh, in this presentation so that you, know, you get a sense of what it's like and this is portable. I have an article uh, that describes this whole presentation out there and if you want you know, to do this at your campus then you can. Okay? Uh, so these are the beliefs about learning that, that make you stupid. One, learning is fast. Uh, students grossly uh, o uh, uh, overestimate how much they learn in like one reading. They think if I've read everything once by the time the test comes along that's enough. All right? And so I tell them, you know, you learn more at review than you do reading it the first time. You've got to finish reading the material a few days ahead of time so that you spend a few days in review. And they look at me like, you're crazy, right? So um, anyway, so learning is fast. Being good at the subject is a matter of inborn talent and hard work. We see this a lot in science and math. Oh, I'm not good at math. I'm not good at science. What they're saying is, I have this ability and I can't move beyond this stage. No, actually, it's a matter of hard work, you know, that you, you have to say, you know, instead of saying I'm not good at magic, I have to work especially hard at math. Okay, so uh, 
Uh, knowledge is composed of isolated facts. Almost every study that looks at, at student beliefs has found that the students who memorize isolated facts uh, do very poorly. Uh, and, and flashcards, uh, which, which don't necessarily have to be bad, really lend themselves to students trying to memorize these isolated facts. And, and so actually, I don't, uh, flashcard, I mean, students like flashcards because they are very easy to do, and it makes you think like you're studying, but a lot of times they actually are, are counterproductive if they don't use them correctly. Okay. And I'm good at multitasking, which is a huge issue, of course, uh, because students think they're good at multitasking because they do it all the time, uh, but they've never actually compared uh, their performance multitasking to their performance actually focusing on one topic at a time. And all the research shows that most everyone is terrible at multitasking. Okay, they think they're good at multitasking, but they're not. Okay, and I actually have a demonstration for this, but uh, I don't have time to go into it uh, uh, right now. Okay, all right, so these are the beliefs that make you stupid. That's the first part of the talk. Okay, then I talk about metacognition, which is uh, a student's awareness of their own level of understanding. Freshmen coming in have a, uh, a terrible sense of metacognition. Uh, they are grossly overconfident in how well they, they do. Uh, the reason for this is because they have spent the first 12 years of their you know, education developing a sense of metacognition in high school and junior high school, which is completely inappropriate for college. Okay, so they are overconfident, they stop studying too soon, and they think they do really well. A lot of times they take the test, they think they've done well, and they are just stunned to uh, do very poorly. You know, students, those are the students who come to you and say, I can't believe I made this, you know, this B minus, I studied really hard, I thought I really knew the material. And now you can say, you just have bad metacognition. Okay, now, the way I demonstrate this, and this is something that you can do in, in classes, is uh, at the end of the first exam, uh, in my general psych class, I have uh, students uh, just at, you know, when they're done, I ask them, just, you know, honestly, give me your honest opinion of what percentage of the, of the, of the problems you answered correctly. Okay, what percentage of points do you think you got? Zero to 100%. Alright, and, um, then I can plot it. Okay, here's their estimate right here, and this is here how they actually did, their actual percent. Now, if they have accurate sense of metacognition, their point should lie right along this diagonal. Okay, now, you see that there are a few people who are above, which means that they actually did better than they thought. Okay, but the majority of people are actually below. And it's kind of, uh, some of these points have multiple points, but you see here that some people are really low. And this is the A range, actually, up here. The people who did really well have accuracy to metacognition. And metacognition is actually one of the key distinguishing characteristics between a strong student and a weaker student. Weaker students have terrible metacognition, and that's this group right here. Okay, and so I present this in my freshman uh, convocation, and I say, "This guy, don't be this guy." You know, <laughs> right? Uh, so <clears throat> it kind of, you know, kind of warned them about that. Okay. So. All right. Now, okay. Now. The irony of poor metacognition is that people have no idea how incompetent they are. Okay, A big part of incompetence is not realizing how incompetent you are. And this is not just true in studying, this is true in anything. People who think they're funny really aren't. People who think they're you know, are good drivers really aren't. There's actually a lot of research on, on poor self-awareness and metacognition. And so the problem is that students who most need to listen to my presentation are the ones who don't think they need to listen to my presentation. By the way, uh, this is the same as true the faculty at workshops they give. The faculty who most need to listen to what I have to say are the ones who don't think they need because they already are master teachers. Okay. All right. Um, so I kind of talked about it. All right. Now, so that's kind of the first part. Then I get to the quiz part. Now this is the part where we have audience participation. We're not doing the demonstration yet uh, where that demonstration. Okay. So. Keeping in mind that how, how good of a teacher you are depends on how well you understand how you'll learn, take a look at the following. Um, one of these factors is the most important factor in, in, uh, in how students learn and in, in successful in re, uh, learning. Okay, so read the five and think about which one you think is the most, uh, is the, uh, the most uh, important ingredient for successful learning. Just kind of take a look at it and, and uh, get it in your mind. Everyone got a got a uh, decision? All right. Now we're going to do a uh, uh, 
a little clicker exercise with organic clickers. They're called hands, right? <laughs> Click, you know, it's, just, it's a, just as an aside, it's hilarious to me to think, oh, I can't afford clickers. I can't eat. It's like, you know, you can just do the hand. Uh, and we're going to do that. So you got five fingers. Indicate with your fingers what your choice is. Now, I'm going to count to three. And we're going to put all our hands up simultaneously so that way you can't do what all students do, which is look around and see what they do. Okay, on the count of three, put up your choice. Ready? One, two, three. Put up your choice. Okay. Now look around and see that there is absolutely no consensus in the room. <laughs> okay. Now, that means that whatever the correct answer is, the majority of you got it wrong. Okay? All right. So... What is the correct answer? This is where we're going to do the demonstration. Okay, so look at your handout that you got. Okay, um, read your instructions for the demonstration. Uh, uh, silent to yourself. And uh, then when we get to the demonstration, do your best to follow the instructions. Everyone, everyone had a chance to read their instructions? Anyone need more time? Okay, I'm going to read a list of 24 words, so you just check off on that grid, uh, yes or no. I'm going to read fairly quickly, so you got to pay attention. All right, everyone ready? Here we go, ready. Number one, evening. Number two, country. Number three, salt. Number four, easy. Number five, peace. Number six, morning. Number seven, pretty. Number eight, expensive. Number nine, poor. Number ten, doctor. Number eleven, city. Number twelve, dry. Number thirteen, cold. Number fourteen, love. Number fifteen, bargain. Number 16, war. Number 17, hate. Number 18, wet. Number 19, rich. Number 20, nurse. Number 21, pepper. Number 22, hard. Number 23, ugly. Number 24, hot. Okay, everyone managed to complete that? Was it very easy, hard? Straightforward to do? Okay, good. Now, what I want you to do somewhere on this sheet is I want you to write down as many words as I said as you can remember. to be writing all those words down. There were 24 of them in there. And you are the elite of your colleagues. Still writing down? All right, once you've written down as many as you remember, just go ahead and count up the number uh, that uh, you got. So has everyone got a number? Anyone still need more time? Yeah. All right, now, 
what you just went through is a, is a demonstration of what's, in, what's called depth of processing or levels of processing. Okay, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a framework of memory that was popular in the 1970s, but it's, it's very easy to understand and it's very useful in terms of, of improving learning. Okay, basically it says that processing varies according to uh, depth. Okay, in shallow processing, uh, you tend to focus on spelling and appearance of sound. So this is like what you, happens when you do rote memorization uh, of, of, uh, of flashcards, isolated facts, and things like that. On the other end, you have deep processing, where you think about information meaningfully, especially in a personal sense. And you try and associate it with prior memories or other information. Okay? And deep processing leads to better learning. Okay? Shallow processing leads to poor learning. It's easy to do, but it leads to poor learning. Deep processing is hard to do, but it leads to better uh, uh, memory. Okay. Now, what you didn't know, hopefully uh, you picked up the handout that was on your chair when you came in, uh, is that I actually divided up the room into two groups. Okay. The group over here had a task of uh, checking for E's and Z's. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, would E or G checking be a deep processing task or a shallow processing task? Shallow, right? E's and G's, okay? Over here, I ask you to rate the words about whether they were pleasant or not, right? Would rating the words for pleasantness be deep or shallow? It's deep. You have to think, you know, okay, you know, what's my experiences with that, right? You have to associate it with what you already know, okay? What you just did, okay, uh, was called an orienting task. Okay, so it made you process information in a certain way. All right, whether you wanted to or not, it made you do that. Okay, it's called an orienting task. Okay, now, what you also didn't know is that uh, I actually divided up the room into four groups. Okay, now, for the group in front, okay, uh, I actually warned you that there was going to be a recall task. Okay, you have a sentence in your instructions that said, be forewarned, you're going to have to recall the words. Okay, for the group in back, you had no warning. Okay, it was just I'm just like the meanest professor ever, and, and it was a pop quit, you know, that that uh, nasty pop quit. Okay, so we've actually got four groups. Okay, we've got uh, shallow processing, e.g., checking on this side. We've got deep processing on this side. Okay, and in the front we've got those who were warned that you had to recall as many of these words as possible. And in the back we have poor people who were just blissful ignorance until I gave them the bad news. All right. Now, who's going to remember the most? Think about this. Now, if motivation to learn matters, if you just intend to learn, if that helps, then the front of the room should learn best, because those are the ones who are forewarned, right? Okay, now, if deep processing matters, regardless of intention, then this side of the room should learn best, right? Okay, but if both deep processing and intention to learn matter, it's this group that should the front uh, uh, house right of the, of the room. Okay. How do you think it's going to come out? Who do you think learned the best? You mean this group? All right, let's see. I'll ask everyone to stand. Please. Okay. Now, I want you to remain standing if you remembered at least three words. Three words or more, you can remain standing. Otherwise, please be seated. And remember... Okay, if you're, okay, six words. Six words or more, please remain standing. Fewer than six words, you can sit down. Okay, lost some people there. Nine words. Nine words? Well, lost quite a few there. Okay, all right. Twelve words? Okay, so we've lost most of this group over here. And does it matter if they had, were forewarned about the task or not? No, it actually didn't. Right? I'm, I'm, I've got, I've got one brave soul here. Okay, but look over here. Okay, deep processing. Is there a difference between those who intended to learn and didn't intend to learn? Not really. Okay, some at 12, right? Okay, 15. 15. They lost this side. Uh, okay, uh, 18. Notice I'm, I've still got like even numbers here, right? Uh, 21. Okay. Oh, it's down to two. Okay. And it's, it's two in the not forewarned group. Notice. Okay. How many did you get? 22. 
22? 22. Oh, okay, well, it's a tie. So congratulations. You tie. How did it come out? What mattered? It was hypothesis number two. Right? Deep processing mattered. Did intention, did being forewarned about that matter? No. Yes. Yes. Well, you say obviously. Did you all notice they were paired? No, a lot of them didn't notice they were paired. So, I'm wondering, like, you know, just what role that has, like, in the development of the thing about this, that, like, the recall? Yeah, or? the pairing really helps, and, and they, they tend to cluster together. A lot of you probably over here on the deep level, you know, you, you remember them in pairs. Okay, you may have noticed them in pairs. That really helps learning. Now, the group over here doesn't notice the connection. A lot of them didn't notice the connection. Now, think about this in terms of your own teaching. I mean, you are teaching, and you're teaching from a, you know, for you, it's connected knowledge. Okay, but if the students are thinking about memorize, memorize, are they making those connections which will help them to, to learn? No. Okay, so that, that connection is something that's part of deep processing. You notice associations that help you to learn. Is that, was that your? Yeah, no, that was just, yeah, curious about how that was. Yeah, yeah, there, there's a, yeah, it really helps in me, uh, meaningful clustering uh, of material. Okay. So, uh, what does that uh, say? All right, intentional learn. Did that matter? Actually, no. Okay. Intentional learn is not important, and uh, motivation learn is actually not important. Uh, now, everyone kind of sucks in their breath because they've been told, oh, what is it important? Well, it's important to the extent that you bring about your best learning strategies. Okay, but if you can, you are have every intention to learn, which a lot of struggling students do. They want to learn, but they have poor study strategies. But it's not the intent or motivation to learn that matters. It's the study strategies that you use. Motivation and intent to learn is only useful to the extent that it brings about your use of your most effective learning strategies. Okay, and that's a hard uh, lesson for students to learn. Okay, paying close attention to the material you study. I think you all were paying close attention, right? You all did the past actually, right? Attention actually is necessary, but it's not sufficient for learning. Okay, learning a way that matches your personal learning style. I always put this in there because people believe in learning styles. Learning styles, I'm talking about the classic, you know, kinesthetic, uh, 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 verbal, vis auditory, visual. Uh, there's no evidence actually that any of that is useful. <laughs> so, uh, just, you know, for you, and, and I tell students this, and they, they always have something, and I said, look, you know, you're, you get on your first job, you know, you talk to your boss, and they're trying to explain it, and you say, oh, excuse me, I'm a kinesthetic learner, could you, like, act out your instructions for me? <laughs> you know, it, you want to learn in the most effective, you know, in, in the ways possible, right? Okay, so uh, the time you spent studying, okay, no, because you all spent the same amount of time studying. All right, so what is the correct answer? It's what you think about while studying, okay? All right, so congratulate yourself, okay, on that one. All right, so uh, implications. So uh, I already, kind of already talked about, about those. Let's see where I am. Okay, and uh, implications for, for students. So the problem that students come in is they have highly practiced bad learning strategies. Okay? It's not that they just have them. Is that they are practiced. Okay, they've done them for years, right? And they have to not just learn the new strategies, they have to unlearn these old, highly overlearned strategies. It takes a lot of time and effort on their, their part. Okay, so, uh, and, and what I want them to do is think about their study skills as orienting tasks. Like, is this making me think about material uh, meaningfully? Because a lot of students pick study strategies that are easy to do and make them feel like they're learning when actually they're and the, the hallmark of a bad study strategy is it leads to overconfidence. You do it, and it leads to terrible metacognition. You think you've learned when you don't have it. Okay, um, now these findings are it's really counterintuitive uh, to students. Students think that I'm good at studying, and the difference is how much I study and the intensity of study. And what I'm telling you is that, uh, that uh, study strategies differ in terms of effectiveness, and you've got to find one that, that, that's effective. Okay, if you have an ineffective study strategy, it doesn't matter how motivated you are, it doesn't matter how long you, you spend doing it, you're not going to learn. Okay? All right, uh, so learning is hard work, but not all hard work leads to learning, because they can really bend themselves out of shape doing ineffective things. Okay, uh, for faculty, uh, the implications are that pedagogy really matters. Okay, so uh, what you do in terms of designing your pedagogy has a huge impact on how well students learn. Okay, so the more you know about 
how students learn, the better off you are. And you can consider your pedagogy in terms of worrying tasks. Like, you know, what is this student, what is this making students do? Too often faculty say, well, I'll give you a 10 page paper because it's an English class and I need to give you a 10 page paper instead of what am I trying to accomplish with this presentation, with this paper? Okay, what am I making students think about? Right? What do I want them to learn? What do I want them to be able to do? Right? And I know you've talked about student learning outcomes. This is kind of, that, that kind of where I, I kind of match with, uh, with that. Okay? Now, if you want to operationalize deep processing, I, I do it in these, uh, uh, four, uh, basic, uh, uh, dimensions. Elaboration. It makes you think about, uh, associations related concepts. Distinctiveness. It, it highlights the key distinctive, uh, distinctive properties between this concept and related concepts. Personal, if you can relate it to your own personal experience, it really helps. You can't always do that, but if you can, then you should do it. An appropriate retrieval and application. Now, this is something that students do far too little of. They think about how am I supposed to be using this information, and they practice using and applying it. And if you're a good faculty member, you give them opportunities in class to use and apply the information in the way that you expect them to be able to do. Okay? All right, so these are the properties which students and faculty can judge whether their assignments are leading to these processes. All right, uh, so the afternoon after presentation, it was a huge success. Uh, and uh, the, uh, well, I didn't, that sounded terrible, didn't it? Uh, so it was, it was a very successful. Students really liked it. Uh, and um, then I had to do a follow-up. But I really wasn't sure exactly how successful it was. So in 2009, I did a, uh, an assessment uh, of it. I'm not going to go into great detail about this, uh, how I did this. I did it in two ways. The first study, I uh, had three sections of foundations, our introduction to college life, and I actually went and gave the presentation to the class, and they did like a pre-post kind of uh, a survey just to see what the impact was. Now, the second part, I took foundation classes, and I didn't, I, I had them did a pre-test, and they went and heard my convocation, and then uh, they did a post-test a few weeks later. Okay, so one of them, I was actually presenting it directly to them in a small classroom setting at study one. The second one, it was just like, what the general impact of, of uh, my, my presentation, you know, uh, where you attend it with a group of 400 other students. Okay. Um, so, I'm just going to show you the data. Uh, this is, uh, the presentation was very well received. Uh, this is like, uh, was it interesting? Uh, the, and seven was uh, strongly agree. Uh, this is the standard deviation bar. Here's the mean. Uh, gave me information I didn't know, it was useful, uh, I would incorporate the information to my own study, uh, it taught me how to study, it was valuable to me, and I would recommend this to other people. So it, it really was very well received. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting was uh, the, uh, you know, what students rated is most important, kind of what we just went through. Uh, here is the desire to learn, attention to learn, learning style, time, and deep processing. And you can see that desire to learn was uh, before, it was the highest rated response. Okay, afterwards, it was, uh, you know, down to 2% and deep processing, uh, because it went through the demonstration I just went through with you, it was up at 93%. Okay, but what's interesting is two weeks later, the two week follow-up, it actually had dropped to 87%. Okay, so after a couple of weeks, students started to forget. They started moving, you know, and under stress, they started moving back to their, their old habits. Okay? Now, What's really interesting is what happened to the group that just kind of heard it as part of a general convo, where they may be texting during the convo and, and all their so convos are named for this freshman program we did. All right, so the general trend of the results is the same. So desire to learn was rated highest at the beginning, and then it was, uh, you know, went down after the presentation, and deep processing was um, uh, rated highest afterwards, but only by 57% of the students. I mean, I had Gone, they'd gone through the demonstration, I had given them the answer, and 43% of them still didn't know what the correct answer was two weeks later, two or three weeks later. It shows you just can't simply tell students and do a demonstration and expect them to learn. Okay? All right, so uh, uh, the, the, the presentation was effective. It, uh, it changed the way they, they looked at studying, and there's some evidence that it changed the way they, they approached studying. But the problem was that it pretty clearly uh, was having an only a temporary effect. You can't like simply change the behavior in, in one 45-minute presentation students forget, and under the stress of, of the semester, they fall into their bad old habits. Okay, so to address these issues, uh, I decided to develop a series of videos on how to study that contains the same information of the presentations 
I, I get. Okay, so I wanted to contain the same information. I wanted to serve as a resource for the teachers and students, so students could view it, and teachers could also use it. Uh, I'm working with students who are struggling. Okay, um, I wanted to be as flexible as possible, so I divided it into five brief modules. Each one's about uh, six to eight eight minutes, and I tried to make it so that it was worth the investment in, in time. Okay. Uh, I looked at the uh, existing videos on YouTube on studying. It's dismal. Uh, a lot of them are like comments to me, like "Go to class, take notes, you know, get plenty of sleep." Uh, there is misinformation out there. Chew gum while studying, you know, and <laughs> things like that. Uh, and then, you know, I worked with our, our videographer at the time, Nathan Cruz, who was who did an excellent job of translating what I had to say into something visually appealing. A lot of the the uh, credit for the videos goes to him. Uh, and then uh, last summer, on one morning, I filmed all five uh, of them. Okay, so it is now a video series on YouTube. Uh, it is available for anyone to use. Okay, and you have the the uh, the web page there and the uh, uh, also the the QR code. All right, so they went live last August. Uh, and like I say, they're they're uh, you know freely available. Anyone to use now in use in a number of colleges uh, uh, across the country, a, a medical school, uh, and a number of community colleges, right? And um, so I divide it in these five topics, and you have it on your handout uh, there. Uh, feel free to use them. Uh, feel free to send me some feedback uh, about uh, how you use them and, and how they, they work. Okay, since I presented them. Uh, They've been very well received. Uh, they're, they're now pretty widely uh, used. Uh, last I looked, it's like 130,000 unique hits on the first one, but I can get to that in a second. Uh, they're, they're being closed captioned, uh, because in the state of California, in order to use something in, in the classroom, it has to be closed captioned. Uh, Gallaudet is, is, is closed captioning them. Uh, faculty love them. Uh, advanced students uh, really wish they had them uh, when they were uh, freshmen, but the freshman reaction is really kind of mixed. Okay, because it's not what they want to hear, right? Uh, so this has kind of been interesting. This is, this is the uh, viewing pattern of all five videos. So you know, the first one by far is the most pop, you know, viewed, and then it really drops off for the uh, four. The last one is what to do when you flunk an exam. So not necessarily everyone's going to look at that one. Okay. Now but this is really curious because this this whole pattern has been you know in existence since they were posted. And it's really been curious to me. Uh, I've been trying to think of why this, this pattern exists. So, you know, I think it's the difference between what we say as faculty and what students hear. Uh, so we say, watch these videos, and we mean, you know, watch them, pay close attention to them, learn from them, incorporate the information, and the students think, you know, I watch the first one, that's the next. You know, and I think I know this already, I'm already doing this when they really aren't. And so they really miss the point a lot of them. Because viewing videos on YouTube is kind of supposed to be an entertaining pass experience for a lot of them. So uh, it didn't, you know, it, it's useful to a lot of students, but uh, a lot of students kind of uh, miss the point. Uh, so, and this is kind of what I came up with, and I'm going to try and do some research in this starting in the fall if I can. So the students want to know, how do I make grades? And the fat videos basically are about, like, how do you, how do you learn? Right? And it's not exactly what they're, they're wanting. They want a concrete, uh, foolproof, easy method, uh, and I'm saying here's a framework for effective study that's going to take effort uh, for you to incorporate. Uh, they want simple tweaks. I'm telling them they need to think in a completely different way. They want immediate results, uh, and I can't stress this enough. Uh, I had a student who uh, I was I was working with in general psych who, who flunked, I mean, badly the first two exams. I kind of explained this framework, and uh, he still, you know, he did a little better on the third exam, and he said, I tried it your way, and it didn't work. Okay, as if you know, you could incorporate all of that, and it would make like an immediate change. But that's you know, students want that immediate, that immediate change. They want the guarantee that you know, if I work hard, I should be able to pass. And, and I'm saying, no, you work hard, and you may still fail. All right. So, really, what you need to do is to use the, to use the videos effectively. You need to design something around them to scaffold the uh, the, uh, the the content of them. Okay, and there are a number of people who've done this in different ways. Some people uh, show one uh, every day the first week of class and discuss them. Some people use them as an extra credit assignment. Some people use them and ask questions about them in class. There's a number of ways, and I'm trying to sort out ways uh, to use them uh, in the next year. Okay, 
But it's a resource that will save the teacher time, but will not replace the teacher. So the kind of ideally, if you're working with a struggling student, I would say, I would tell them, the student, you know, go watch this video and come back with me and to me and, and come up with three things that you will do differently according to the video. Something along those, those lines. Okay. Uh, so these are some suggestions that uh, uh, that I have. By the way, if anyone is interested in uh, any of the PowerPoint that I have, just email me on the app. Okay. All right. Now, so here we are, and I'm going to, uh, I know we have to have a Q&A and, and, and things like that, uh, but I, I want to make uh, this one last section here, talking about what things that faculty need to know to help them work with students, help the students to learn. All right, so we know that deep processing in some form helps the student to learn. So why don't we always design our presentations, our pedagogy, and our assignments to, uh, to lead to deep processing? Okay, the answer to that is something called, um, okay, let me back up here. Right. If you ask faculty, most faculty, what are the critical elements in, in uh, sort of good classroom pedagogy, you're going to say the following three things, engagement, active learning, and struggle. Okay, we want our students to struggle with content. And the, the assumption is, in our mental model, that the harder they struggle with material, the better they'll learn. Um, all three of those are wrong, okay? All right, uh, and let's talk about struggle, okay? There is something out there called cognitive load theory, which some of you may have heard of. It was developed by John Sweller and uh, his uh, colleagues on Marion Burr is one of them, okay? Uh, and mental effort is the uh, a, a amount of concentration, you have, okay? Your ability to focus and concentrate on a certain topic. The thing you got to know about concentration is that it's always a limited resource. You only have a limited amount available to you at any given time. You can divide your concentration on multiple tasks, but if the number of tasks you're trying to do, the demands on your cognitive, uh, uh, your concentration exceed your uh, available amount of concentration and effort, your performance is going to suffer. All right? You always have this limited amount of concentration. You can do one, maybe two or three tasks, but if the demands of your concentration exceed your available amount, you're going you're gonna to perform poorly. This is why you should not, you know, drive and talk on cell phones. Because, uh, you know, it's dividing your concentration. You only have a limited amount. And this is why you should never, ever text while driving. Right? Okay, which, like, what, 75% of teenagers do. Okay? Uh, this is the reason uh, why. So you can do multiple tasks. As long as the cognitive load doesn't exceed the available mental effort. This is, this is a, sort of a demonstration. So here's your available mental effort, your amount of available concentration. Okay, now in a classroom setting, you have uh, different kinds of cognitive load. Okay, this is called intrinsic load. Okay, uh, intrinsic load has to do with uh, how difficult the con uh, it is for, to learn a concept. Some things have greater intrinsic load than others. So learning vocabulary, for example, has a fairly low intrinsic load, because you can learn vocabulary pretty much in isolation. Other things that, that require greater intrinsic load are concepts which uh, depend on other concepts uh, to, uh, to understand. Okay, uh, so for example, I teach statistics, so understanding like uh, significance levels depends on probability, and it, it depends on decision making, and, and type one, type two errors, and so there's a lot of, of scaffolding elements you've got to understand to understand significance. Okay, intrinsic load depends on just uh, simply how many different related concepts you have to understand. Then there's germane load. Germane load is the amount of, of, uh, of cognitive load imposed by the pedagogy. Different pedagogies require different amounts of, of uh, cognitive load. Uh, you know, lecture actually has fairly low cognitive load. Uh, problem-based learning, where you have to like understand a problem, has high germane cognitive load. You've got to understand what is this problem I'm doing. Okay, and it, it really imposes an extra load. And then extraneous load is anything that you that uh, just not related to learning at all. So this is the uh, humorous anecdotes you tell about your dog from last weekend. Okay, all right. So all of these three things have to be less than the available mental effort. Okay, all right. If it is more, then the student is just not going to learn anything. Okay. Furthermore, if it's equal to it then the student may actually perform an activity successfully and learn nothing from it. Okay, because they have spent all of their mental effort getting through the task. They have no mental effort available to actually think about what they did and why they did it. Okay? So, 
cognitive load theory says that you've got to worry about the amount of, of mental effort students have and the cognitive load of your pedagogy. All right. Now, let's see how this works. Okay. I'm going to, there's a little demonstration for you. Okay. Um, I'm going to bet each of you, okay, a uh, one week ski vacation in Park City, Utah, this uh, ski season, that you cannot name the days of the week uh, out loud in order in under five seconds. Okay? We're going to try this. Okay? And I say go, you can, you can see if you can do this. Okay. Ready? Set? Go. <laughs> no, no, no. Not that order. In alphabetical order. Okay. Ready? Set? Go. <laughs> first one's Friday. I, this is so sad. The first one's Friday. Okay. No one's even willing to try. Now, what if, you're, what if you present this topic and then your students go, it's too hard, I'm not even going to try. Come on now. This is, this is what your students are going through, right? It's good to put ourselves in, you know, you know, let me just overwhelm you with my brilliance, and this is what it feels like to be overwhelmed, right? This is what it means to have a cognitive load that exceeds your available mental effort. You can do this, but it's, it's very effortful. Okay. Um, all right. So, you all didn't do it. Okay. <laughs> I, I know that it's the I know it's the last day of the conference, okay. But if you did it, then you would be engaged in doing this topic, okay. You it would have been very active for you, and you would be working hard and struggling, okay. And if you'd actually done it, you probably would not have been able to name the fourth day, okay, because you were spending all your time trying to work through the exercise and not really thinking about well that's the first one, that's the second one, that's the third one, okay. You wouldn't have learned anything, even though you went through that that exercise successfully, right? And too often, we make the assumption as, as faculty, oh, well, I really made you struggle with that, so now you must know it, okay? If I overwhelm you with the cognitive load, you can actually get through an activity successfully and learn nothing from it. Okay, uh, here it is. Okay, so now you can go back to your campuses and do this activity and, and uh, it's, okay. So, uh, You've got to worry about the cognitive load. Um, as I said before, learning is hard work, but not all hard work leads to learning. Okay. You've got to manage that, that cognitive load. Okay. Um, and uh, you've got to consider what the student's level of, of mental effort uh, uh, is. It's something that you can't manipulate, something you can only monitor. You, can, you manipulate uh, germane and uh, extraneous cognitive load. You can't manipulate intrinsic cognitive load. You only can only monitor it. All right. Now, Oftentimes, faculty at this point think, well, like the students are just sitting there, so why is cognitive load an issue? Actually, the students are sitting there taking notes. At least they're sure supposed to be. All right? And note taking uh, is right here. This is a uh, graph of the amount of mental effort required of different tasks. Okay? The amount of cognitive load of different tasks. Okay? Note taking from a lecture is right here. It's right above playing a game of chess okay, by experts. Okay, it is an incredibly effortful task to do because you basically are listening and comprehending and you are freeform writing, right, a, a narrative that makes sense to you. It is incredibly time consuming and effortful. So if your students are actually taking notes, uh, then it, uh, uh, is, they have very little available cognitive load to really reflect on what it is you're talking about. It is something that faculty really need to consider, all right? Now, at this point, someone always says, well, should I hand out the PowerPoint slides you know, in advance? Because that'll reduce the cognitive load. And it's, it's, all, it's a tough question. Uh, I actually don't teach with PowerPoint. I teach with chalk. Um, uh, kind of for this very reason, because it's a problem that's created by using PowerPoint. Okay? And uh, uh, you have to balance like the cognitive load with the fact that they're not going to Many students don't process deeply if they've already got the, the notes. Right? But it kind of leads into the, the next idea. Uh, okay, well, all right, so engagement and active learning and struggle, especially engagement and active learning, are buzzwords. You hear it all the time. But actually, they're, they're really strict limitations. They're, they're severe limitations for the concept. 
from a cognitive point of view. You can be an active learner, but if you're pro actively processing at, at a shallow level, you're not going to learn. Yeah, you can be engaged, but you can be engaged in a poor study strategy, you're not going to learn. Okay, actually, I, I think we need better terms than engagement and active learning. Uh, it's just my little pet peeve. Okay, um, but what this says is that, you know, you, you've got to balance the two. And here's the thing. Okay, deep processing increases cognitive load. Okay, you can't do all deep processing because it increases cognitive load. Too much cognitive load is bad for learning. All right, so what you must do as a teacher is balance those two. Right? Teaching is not about presenting information. It's about managing multiple competing factors. What do students know? What learning activities are they using? What's my pedagogy? What's the topic? What's the intrinsic load of the topic? And the teacher has to manage, manipulate, and monitor the student level of understanding and cognitive load. That's what teaching is all about. Okay? All right. Um, <laughs> So here are some of the things that you've got to really worry about, uh, the complexity of teaching. Uh, so just uh, trying to monitor all these different activities. That's a challenge of teaching. Okay? Uh, and a lot of people outside of teaching don't, you know, they think it's easy, you know, because you just present the information and then that's it. A master teacher knows a lot of different methods. They can monitor the teaching, uh, uh, the, the level of understanding, and they make adjustments constantly as they go along. They know a lot of different techniques and they can adjust based on what the students are doing. This is the reason why the 9 o'clock section of your class is so different than the 8 o'clock section of your class. And what works at the 8 o'clock doesn't work at the 9 o'clock. Okay? All right, uh, there's a model. Uh, I'm not going to worry about it. All right, so um, I'm, I'm trying to scoot along here. So here's the... Sorry, what? Well, I, I talked about cognitive load. I'm sure you all have... For a lot of me. And, and uh, like I said, I'd be happy to talk to anybody after. So here's the kind of the take home message for you. All right, I, I've tried to describe misconceptions that, um, that students and, and faculty have uh, about, um, about how uh, students learn and the misconceptions that, that undermine learning. Okay, I've tried to, uh, or I've described for you a live presentation that I give that can be replicated and a set of videos that you can use to try and make students more effective uh, learners. I um, attempted to give you a more sophisticated model of, uh, of learning that includes things like depth of processing and cognitive load, so hopefully will give you a greater uh, uh, insight uh, into, uh, into teaching. And um, I've tried to convince you that teaching is a complex interaction of multiple factors, some of which the, the, the fact member can manipulate, uh, some of which the, the faculty member can only uh, manage or, or monitor. Okay. Right. And then I wanted to finish with this thought uh, because I know that uh, a lot of you are doing online learning and, and I was supposed to address directly uh, online learning and I really haven't done that. Whether it's face-to-face -face or online learning, you know, learning only takes place in one place and that is inside the student's head. Whether you do online learning or face-to-face -face learning, you've got to design pedagogy that sort of incorporates what we know about how people learn in order to be effective learners. So, um, that's uh, my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Yes? Um, I'm wondering about the response to um, actively address concentration on reading loads and, and workloads and how how that factors into the cognitive load question, the processing question, because I definitely am a professor who assigns a lot of reading, uh -huh. um, but perhaps that's not the right thing to do. I mean, I just wonder where that plays in. Um, when you look at the trend lines and how little we assign now, I'm wondering like, how do you respond to that? It's, you know, th there's not a simple answer to that question. I, I think, you know, we have to bring students up to a high level of reading, but it's, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of, of bringing them to that point, okay? And so I think we want them to get there, but we have to recognize that if they're down here and we're, we want them to be up here, you can't just simply say, okay, now I want you to get as high up here as possible. I really believe, you know, in Vygotsky's level of scaffolding where you can kind of structure it across the, uh, you know, across the semester. And if you're at a small school or a school which really cares about its curriculum, you can design the curriculum to, to accomplish that very thing. So the introductory courses will have a certain level of reading. 
or amount of reading, and then the advanced courses will scaffold them along. That's a, that can be a curriculum issue as well as an individual classroom issue. Um, but it, it is something that you have to just adjust as you go along because you have to recognize that if it's overwhelming the students, they're not really learning, and you get more by kind of shaping that behavior. That's kind of what I would say, and there's not a simple answer to that question. It, you have a question? Yeah. Is, there, is there a distinction in the way you apply this, this set of knowledge to skill-based learning rather than content-based learning? So if we say our learning outcomes are about really critical thinkers or curiosity for lifelong learners, mm -hmm. then maybe is that sense of struggle and being lost and material overwhelm help with those skills rather than the content, or is it, it is, apply the same way? It's, uh, there's, there's actually overlap, but uh, because the two are not as distinct as a lot of people, I think. I tend to think of them uh, as you know, critical thinking as a skill that you apply to different content areas. Uh, there, 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 is, there are distinctions to be made. I didn't go into uh, specific areas, of, like uh, automaticity, where you develop the automatic thinking. Uh, in, it's, it's especially relevant to skill-based learning as opposed to content-based learning. Even in content-based learning, though, you have something very similar, which is overlearning, which is the amount of practice you have in retrieving and using information, and, and that will actually make it faster for you. Um, so there is a distinction to be made uh, between skill and content-based learning, uh, which I didn't go into. But actually, a lot of the principles are, are, are very similar. The idea of like if you if you learn the level of complexity. You know that the you know that if you develop the level of complexity of students that you want in the students and you have them practice it, you know repeatedly, then then they're going to be better learners and more likely to apply it uh, in novel situations. Um, so I'm not sure that completely answers your question. Uh, you know, but I understand the distinction between skill based and but a lot of at a very fundamental level these these would apply to either area. I guess. Sorry, I can't. We can talk more about that afterwards, I guess. Yes, Are there variances in the cognitive role that individuals can carry? Um, is, is that a difference between uh, better students and, and, and poorer students, or is it roughly the same for all? Uh, uh, there's, there's variances in a lot of different ways. Uh, so even during the course of the day, your level of cognitive, uh, your mental effort varies depending on, you know, did you just have a red bowl or not, or, you know, did you just wait, did you just have a huge omelet at the omelet station? You know, so, uh, it actually fluctuates throughout the day, and it fluctuates based on how your level of alertness and arousal. But it's pretty clear, though, that that uh, there are individual differences in the capacity for for cognitive load. I'm not sure that it relates directly, though, to how well a student uh, does. It, it probably is a factor in that student good students learn how to use their cognitive load effectively. So they know, like, yeah, some students will take all hard classes; other students will will kind of structured out so that they have the one that they're going to focus on and the others are not as, you know, so you learn to uh, sort of use your level of cognitive, uh, of mental effort effectively, you know, that's really the key part, not like how much you have, it's like how do you use it. And that relates back to the metacognition skills. Yeah, exactly, absolutely right. Yes? I just have two questions. So one, when the student asks, is this going to be on the final, is that just meta, are they actually trying to manage their mental load as they're Trying to figure out where to take notes, is it? So the question becomes less uh, troublesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, right. it, it's funny. One of the funny things is that one of the uh, videos on how to make a that I looked at said, you know, always ask your your fact member, is this going to be on the test? It was, it was like, you know, this is like great, you know, teaching your these person how to be, be annoying students. But uh, uh, but actually, a lot of times that you know, is this going to be on the test? Or is it going to be in the final? Is kind of a, a strange, tortured way of asking, like you know, like how it, you know, you know, why is this important or something? And it, so I do give the students some benefit of the doubt sometimes in terms of like they don't know how to like express you know what they're trying to ask, and, they, and it comes out in this you know to us this terribly inappropriate way. But it can be cognitive. It is kind of metacognition. You know that way uh, in terms of like how important is this, and a good faculty member will tell them how important it is. The other, yeah. the other question I have is: there any work being done to relate this to seat time to Carnegie units, uh, seat time versus uh, you know study time outside the classroom? Is uh, there? No, not that, not that I'm aware of. Uh, that would be a great question to to ask. And you know, I, it's always it was hard time. It's always hard 
trying to relate it to the amount of, of study time. Because this, you know, students are good at fooling themselves into thinking that they're studying. And then the amount of time is, is not a, a good measure because it's the amount of time like they've spent like, you know, Facebooking in between while trying to read the, you know, they'll say, well, I you know, read for eight hours. Well, six of those hours were responding to text messages and Facebooking. And so you can't really get a, a good measure uh, on that. And that would be a really good question to ask, but it'd be a really hard question. And there are distinctions for adult learners versus traditional learners? Um, the, um, the, the, the distinction would not be, in, in terms of these fr this framework, it, it works for adult as well as, but you're going to have, the, the whole idea here is you're going to have a, fr it's a framework, it's not like a, a set like read three times in, in outline or something like that. So the way that the adults are going to implement it is going to be really different because their life experiences are different. And they have more prior knowledge, you know. So the whole idea is like it's flexible enough that anyone can use it. The downside is that it's not so specific. You know, but everyone wants their own tailored program of what they need to do. And so that's not what I'm, I'm offering. But and then uh, I've had a number of people have said you know, they work with students with learning disabilities or ADHD, and that's not something I actually know about. Uh, but you know, they they have used the videos, and I guess they find them useful. Uh, so, yes. I know that it's really important for a lot of students, um, the relevance and context in which they're, they're learning, and I just wonder about, it, what's your sense of whether um, a, a course that uses these kinds of videos and that um, is as uh, effective as perhaps, um, that's done like a University 101 kind of a class, mm -hmm. or whether you take a content-based class and, and explicitly put these kinds of skills into that class, mm -hmm whether that has a greater effect because now um, my sense is that students go to these, you know, you know learn how to take, be in college kind of classes and they don't take it as seriously as they might say their biology class in which they're being taught the same basic mm -hmm. concepts about studying. So just yeah, to that's a great that. question. That's, that's something that I'd really like to I investigate. Um, but clearly the message, you know, if you have a, a, a class and you incorporate it into that class, then that's sending a message very clearly that, you know, you're your faculty member who is responsible for like, assessing you thinks this is important, this is useful to you. So I think that's a, a very powerful message to have. But I, I've not done any specific sort of uh, uh, studies on, on that. I know they're being used, a lot of people have listed them on their individual syllabi, you know, and website. I have it on mine. Uh, but like I have some colleagues who, like the first week of class, they do one each, you know, each time, they actually devote class time to it. And, and it makes more sense in a psychology class to resolve psychology stuff. Um, and, and I think that's really going to be more effective than just listing on syllabus. You know, uh, uh, that's, that's another thing that I've been surprised is number of stu faculty who kind of said, oh, I list on my syllabus, so therefore, it's just like, you know, I present the information, so therefore they're responsible for learning it. So I've listed on the, the video, so therefore they're responsible for watching them and understanding them. And, you know, there's a big gap between what I'm saying and what the students understand. So, uh, but you kind of have to force them to watch them and, and, and understand them, and, and that may be done better in the context of an individual class. I don't know, but at Stanford we have small foundation classes of 2025, and it, it is like a regular class. So I, I would suspect that that would still be pretty effective. So it's an open question. It's a great question. Uh, yeah. Could you talk a bit about like the inverted classroom and how this might apply there? And I'm also thinking about some of the high impact learning practices that AAC and you talks about, where how these your concepts fit. Yeah. That, that. Okay. Well, you know the 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 inverted or flipped classroom. Actually, this, these videos make a lot of sense actually for that kind of a thing. You know, so you you get, get like give them a pretest and have them go watch the videos, give them a, the post test or something like that. So that's very useful. So I think the you know these kinds of videos would help in that if, if you take that approach. Now, are you asking, like, what do I think about the inverted classroom? In general, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, if you take a contextual approach to, to teaching, which I do, uh, then you're going to conclude that, that, like, inverted classroom is going to work really well in some topics with some students and not with others. I think we need to move away from this idea of, like, this is the best method and we should all be using this method. We should all be using problem-based learning because... And, and I don't say that perfectly with Mary Sue. Mary Sue did a great job of do, doing our problem-based learning grant, but not everyone is cut out for problem-based based learning. Um, 
uh, and, and not all students respond well to it, and not, it doesn't work in all topics. So I think the same thing, what's going to happen in a very classroom is, is the same thing that's happened in every other uh, topic. They're going to find sometimes it works in some situations, some faculty learn it, other times they're, it's not going to work and, and people are going to wonder who thought of this idea. Okay. So we need to start thinking about, you know, you know, what topics does this work for? What kind of students does this work for? You know, what kind of, you know, is a teacher going to be comfortable with this? Because the teachers want a certain level of control in the classroom. And so teachers who want a lot of control are probably not going to like the inverted classroom as much. Well, maybe they will, because they actually can do more of it. So, like, what topic, what kind of learning goals is this, this topic, this, this good for? So I think it's, it's an exciting development, uh, and it certainly lends itself to online learning, but I think there are going to be areas where it's just not going to be successful, and, and students, it's just not going to be successful. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Because what you're talking about is a really very complex approach to teaching. Mm -hmm. And how do we, you know, a professor who's going to teach British literature, mm -hmm. or a professor who's going to teach biology, how do we help professors learn to, to deal with these complexities in the classroom? Because, you know, they probably aren't going to have a lot of cognitive Study, you know, learning in there. But well, that's, where, that's where faculty development comes into yeah. play. I mean, you, you always have to. What is your evidence that the students are actually learning? You know, what you know, what is your evidence that your your approach is actually working, and is it the best approach? You know, if, if you look at books like you know how the um, um, uh, what's um, what's the name? How the best uh, uh, yeah. yeah. teachers? What the best teachers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, if you look at that, then what the best college teachers are doing actually is this kind of very complex approach to, to teaching. And they've developed it on their own through years of experience. You know, uh, and so what we can do, I think, in fact, don't, is to kind of talk about these, you know, depth of processing, practice and recall. And, and the same framework would allow faculty to develop their own pedagogies, which are effective for them. And they just have to assess those pedagogies to see what are students really getting out of it. But, you know, all too often teachers get a, have a, a teaching has a, a bad reputation because everyone thinks anyone can do it. And if teaching is all about just presenting information, then anyone can do it. Okay, but if it's about developing understanding, then it's a really complex skill that takes the entire career to develop. So that's my, that's my opinion. So, yeah. Just a quick question. The, the mention you put in there about struggle just is stuck here. Is that, because I know a lot of people who feel that, you know, if they have a hard class, the hard classes are better, you know, and the hard classes are the ones they struggle most, or more students fail, or whatever they plan. Yeah. But I think there's also some advantage to uh, designing a class where students are sort of forced out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so that they sort of get out of schematic thinking and more into unique, you know, applications and things. Could you just briefly just talk about the connections? Well, that's what I said. You know, uh, you know, learning is hard work, but not all hard work is learning. So what are they struggling with and why? Okay, if they're just struggling because I gave them a you know, a 20 page paper, and I think that a 20 page paper leads to more learning than a 10 page paper, then that's struggle that's not like with a purpose. But if I, if I give them a, like, here's a really, uh, difficult, you know, concept. So for example, like in my general psych class, we read a, uh, uh, like a, a book called, uh, the history of the, of the, uh, called Ordinary Men, which talks actually about the people who took part, you know, who, who performed the, the genocide. And I said, well, Okay, if you were one of these soldiers, what would you do? And, and of course, this is not something they expect to get in a, in a class. And so they're struggling, but they're struggling, you know, in a way that I, I believe has a purpose. And, and the outcome, I assess that, that purpose. And, and so therefore, that struggle, you know, that's a struggle that has a, has a goal that I can actually assess. So I'm not saying struggle is bad. I, I'm just saying that, you know, you've got to monitor how much they're struggling and for what purpose they're struggling. Okay, that, that's, you know. So please don't think I'm, I'm saying, you know, make it as easy, but, uh, as, um, you know, struggle doesn't have its place. Because if, you know, conceptual change, which is what we want, is incredibly difficult. Well, thank you.